First of all, we have an amazing live stream plan for you and we've actually done nothing like this before. We have over 10 speakers that are talking over many different subjects, over design, about plugins, project management, product, research, engineering, brand and illustrations. Here's all the lovely faces below of all of our great speakers. Uh, something that we get a lot of questions about uh, and this is a reason that I absolutely love office hours. The question is, how do Figmates, that's right, we call ourselves Figmates, how do Figmates design and how do they use Figma? So we're gonna be able to speak and listen to 10 different speakers about their area of specialty. Now they only have five minutes. So this is gonna be rapid fire. The other thing is, if you're a beginner, there's gonna be content for you. But if you're an expert, there's also gonna be content for you here. So I'm absolutely stoked out of my mind on this live stream, but I can't take up any more time because they need to get to their content. The other thing is, I'm probably gonna butcher their intros or introduce or embarrass them. So without further ado, we're gonna kick it off with Noah Levin, our Director of Product Design. Noah, let's see an introduction from yourself and let's see what you got for us. Awesome, thanks Raji. Hey everyone, I'm Noah, it's nice to meet all, all of you. I'm here in San Francisco enjoying a nice breakfast. It's 8.30 in the morning here and super excited to kick things off. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, as Raji said, I am the Director of Product Design and I'm going to share a bunch of tips with you. See if this works. You should see my Figma screen and also a browser in the background. Looking good. All right. So I don't have a lot of time. I'm going to start the timer and here we go. Um, this is a bunch of rapid fire tips of things that I use if I'm maybe in a hurry between meetings and I need to make a quick mock up or something. Um, and so maybe these will be helpful for you too. So most of these are useful for like maybe quick bug filings or quick sketches, but maybe not so much polished mock ups given the, the pace of things. And if I'm going too fast at any point, don't worry. Uh, this is all going to be posted on the community on my profile page. I'm mostly going to be referencing Mac shortcuts, but for the most part, if you're using Windows or Chromebooks, you can just swap command for control or option for alt. There's a bunch of stuff here, and if you see a little lightning bolt, that means I probably use this shortcut multiple times per day. Uh, and again, this will be referenced later. You can check this out anytime. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. There's going to be a bunch of GIFs, and then I'm going to demo them as, if I can get to it. So the first one is just using screenshots uh, to copy them to your clipboard instead of saving them to your desktop. This is super useful so you don't clutter your desktop with a bunch of images you don't need. Instead, you can just draw the bounds, drop it right into Figma. The next one is quick crop. This is if I am, have an image, I can just double click it if I'm holding option and quickly crop the area that I need. I use this all the time, especially if I'm making something quick, as you can see here. And I'll demo all of these after I get through them all. The next one is duplicate. This is if you hold option when you drag. I use this one constantly for anything from images to text. The next one is group frame. So this is if I grab a bunch of objects and I want to quickly turn it into a frame so I can turn it into something like a card or something different like that. Um, when you're resizing, hopefully you know if you hold shift or option, it will change the direction from which you're scaling, uh, whether it's from the center or whether you're locking the aspect ratio. Um, you can also ignore constraints. So here you'll see that's with constraints, the objects inside move. And if you ignore them when you hold command as you drag, it's super useful for resizing the contents of a frame. Community search. This one's a fun one. I set up an Alfred plugin so I can just type in something quickly and open up something from the Figma community right away, really quickly. This is super useful if I need a quick icon or a quick asset if I'm just trying to illustrate something. Very, very useful. If I have something like arrows I need to draw, I can just hit space and then type in an, a dash and a caret. And with certain fonts, it will actually just turn it right into an arrow for you. Again, if this is too fast for anyone, don't worry. All of this will be shared afterward on the community so you can look at this at any time, including all these GIFs. The next one is scrubbing inputs. So this is where if any input field for the most part on the properties panel, if you hold option, you can just scrub across the screen and it will change the property. Super, super useful if you're especially not trying to be too precise, but you just wanna change something. Uh, from here, you can copy paste style. This is a super useful one if you just if you weren't using components for some reason and you needed to make a change, um, it allows you to quickly change content uh, to match another one. You can even use it for images. Uh, I use my numpad quite often to change opacity of objects. And so in this case, I'm just hitting the number keys to change it to be slower. And from here, another trick is if you hit K, you can quickly scale objects. This is useful if you're not just resizing it, but you need it to change in direction as well. 
Uh, vector shortcuts, if you're drawing something, I oftentimes will hit P to jump to the pen tool and hold option or command to have various effects like removing points or bending objects. Tidy up, super useful if you're just kind of working quickly and you want things to be organized into a grid. Flipping, I use this one constantly. I just hit Shift V or Shift H and it will constantly change the direction of what my object is. Auto layout, super useful. I use this sometimes even for like organizing screenshots and collecting them in just one click and rearranging them if needed. An emoji picker turns out uh, this is just available from pretty much any application. Doesn't have to be in Figma, but I use it in Figma a lot if I need emojis. And there's the window shortcut if you need it as well. There's a couple plugins uh, that I like to use. This one is the material design plugin for icons. I use it because no matter what you're in, if you're in different project spaces, it'll always be available no matter what. I like to remove the background using this remove background PNG. So here's a little image that I'm kind of removing its background in one quick click and dropping it right into the old Figma office rooftop. And finally, downsize, this is one to resize images to shrink them. So I have about 30 seconds left, and I'm going to go ahead and try to demo these in real time, or at least a bunch of them. I don't know. So I'm going to open up the screen. I'm going to use the shortcut that I talked about for copy paste. This allows me to paste it right from the clipboard, super easy. I'm going to double click to just grab, let's say, the image that I wanted here. Um, I'm going to make sure it's cropped just a little tighter. I'm going to duplicate it twice. And oh, my screen froze. Oh, no. Well, I only had four seconds left, so I wasn't going to get much further than that anyway. So I'm going to stop my screen there. And if you are ever interested in looking at any of those, again, go to my Figma profile page. And this whole presentation will be uploaded there just in a minute. So thanks for your time and hope you enjoyed that. Noah, that was amazing and so fast. But I didn't know about the Alfred tip. So awesome. We got to keep on going. So we're on to Aaron next. Thanks so much, Noah. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, Aaron Tesfay. I am an engineer on the prototyping team. I joined last August. And my favorite thing about Figma, the product, is that it caters to a variety of skill sets. Whether you're new, there's so much power in there. And whether you're an expert designer, there's so much more to learn as well. So let's start with uh, two things I wanna share with you today. One about uh, keyboard shortcuts tracking. So Noah just, <clears throat> Noah just gave us a bunch of useful uh, keyboard shortcuts. Now, when I joined in August, I wanted to learn a, as much as possible about the app. And one of the designers on my team showed me about this little tip. And if we go here to keyboard shortcuts, there's this pretty cool, uh, um, uh, area that you can track all the shortcuts that you use for the first time. As an example, the move tool, the frame tool, anytime you actually use the shortcut for the first time, it uh, highlights to blue uh, and gray is, is something that you haven't used. So this is a cool area to explore different shortcuts that you haven't used. Uh, I'll just talk about one that I use quite often and that is opening the design panel and opening the prototype panel. So for example, you're here, you've got two frames and you're in, you're in the design panel. And if you just wanna quickly go to the prototyping panel, just to see what connections you have, just press option nine and then back option eight, option, option nine. So yeah, so uh, definitely check out that tracker and utilize those, those uh, shortcuts Noah uh, just showed us about. And the other thing I wanna talk about is plugins. So say you design this, this landing page uh, and you've got pretty much everything that you want except for a few things. We'll come down to this area uh, where you've got some testimonials and you wanna include some, some images. Um, but rather than going and looking up image one by one, uh, you can utilize uh, plugins. Now, first let's just talk about where plugins live um, in the community area, you'll find this area plugins and there's a bunch of plugins that people have created to make our lives easier. Uh, and you can just click into one just to get the description and you can install it right over here. So let's go back to our, our file and let's use some of these plugins. 
So let's uh, let's add one particular plugin that I think would be cool is called UI Faces. And so what we can do is uh, select all the avatars. We've got six over here. So we're just gonna do select all with the same properties. And then we're going to go to the plugins uh, menu and then we're gonna pull up UI Faces. So uh, we've got a variety of sources we can choose from. Right now, let's, uh, let's get some actors. So we'll use uh, IMDB. Uh, we'll go for female actresses. We'll, uh, we want them happy and a variety of hair colors. And if we just apply avatars, we will get all these, all these uh, actors right, right in there, super simple. Another thing we may want to do is get some, some uh, dummy text for names. And so what we can do is similarly select all of them. And we're going to use a different plugin. This time we're going to use a content reel, a really popular plugin. And there's a variety of uh, um, uh, useful um, dummy text that we can put in. The first one is full name, but you'll notice that that this uses both female and male names. And so uh, Content Reel has a content library that we can search for what we're looking for. So the first one, let's look for full name female. And here we are. And we've got some names with all female names and we're just gonna apply all. And notice we got just random names inside here. Um, yeah, so this this makes it uh, really quick with with plugins. And then finally, the last thing is, say we have this little card here and we want to spruce it up a little bit. What we could do is add a a, a drop shadow, um, and we can fiddle around with making it super nice. Um, and there was a, a, a release uh, last year with um, shadow spread that's really cool that you should check out. Uh, uh, a, a popular effect though, is to layer shadows with different properties. And we can certainly uh, layer it here, but maybe we can just use a plugin to make, um, to make it a little easier for us. So there's this plugin called Smooth Shadow. That's super cool. It gives a nice little uh, uh, default shadow here. Of course, you can play around with the values here, but now you see how it drops off from really, really heavy fades down to light. And, uh, and yeah, so that looks pretty good. Cool. So yeah, so keyboard shortcuts, plugins, uh, definitely uh, check it out. Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, people were going, woohoo. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Mind blown. Thanks for sharing those amazing plugins. We're on to our next speaker. It's Ramilia. We'd love to have you on. Introduce yourself. I'm on mute, of course. Hi, everyone. My name is Ramilia Tai. I am a brand designer on the brand team. I am in the Bay Area. And um, what I love, <laughs> um, what we get to do regularly is the brainstorming part of of, of our branding projects because it's a fun way to think big, think wide, and to have fun. So today I am talking to you about fun brainstorming methods to get your wheels turning by the brand team. So less technical and, and just more fun and creative. Um, and so I'm going to share two methods that we've used um, in past brand identity projects that you can use too that are super simple and really fun. So what this is great for, it's great for sharing inspiration. I feel like um, in this phase, I'm able to, to, to get into a state of flow, to get excited about what I'm working on. It's great for exploring the unknown. So there, right now there's no yes or no right or wrong. It's really cast your net wide and, and, and find what you need. Uh, researching competition. So seeing what's out there, being aware and uh, collaborating with your team. I feel like this is such a fun way to see what your team is thinking about, what's on their mind and, and being able to share. So this first method um, is called a mind map sketchbook. You probably know what a mind map is. Basically it's a diagram used to visually organize information. You can adjust it in any way that you see fit. 
Uh, what we've done in the past is we have the prompt on the very top here, a, a space where you'll be um, putting in images that are inspired by the prompt and keywords that highlight that inspiration. And this is great for highlighting themes that will help you create concepts. And so an example of how we've used it was for the community branding. We use images and pictures that we felt inspired us and we had we captioned it with words um, that were inspired by the prompt, but also captured what that image felt or looked like. Super, super easy. <laughs> this next um, method is simply lists and mood boards. <laughs> We've used this in the past as well. So first you'll start with your prompt, then you'll explain it in a more literal explanation. Then you'll go beyond um, in an abstract way. So think a bit more out of the box. And then on this third part, you should, how should it look and feel? So what you want others to feel when they see it and feel it. An example of how we've used this was for Maker Week. We have Maker Week twice a year where we get to do anything we want as long as it makes Figma better. And so how do we explain it? A full week to work on an, a normal project, solving a problem and so on. And beyond escapism, your new daily routine flipped upside down, how it should feel, daydreaming, a big hug, bright but not dark. See how it starts to, starts to change within each frame. So from there, we've taken these themes and these key words and we put them on a mood board. Um, and then we start to collect images that resonate with those words and even start to collect color palettes. From here, we get to see things holistically. We get, to, we get an idea of the story we're trying to tell. And then from there, we create a concept statement that helps lead this brand identity. So for example, this was called Fantastical World. The concept is about building a world together, adding our own twists to make something beautiful. The response we hope is emotional, nodding to a place of escape. And then we underline words that also resonate within the concept statement. So anyways, that's for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't think I've ever got a view into your world, Remy. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Thank you for sharing your, uh, your tips and your techniques. Very cool. Absolutely. Thanks. Awesome. Well, we're off to Nenurl. Nenurl, so glad to have you on. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself. Yes. Hey, everyone. I'm Nenurl. And I can't do two things at one time, so I'm going to share. Okay, great. I'm Nanura. I am a researcher on the growth team here at Figma. And one of my favorite things about working at Figma is <laughs> really just the jokes. Everyone has such a great sense of humor. And so there is never a dull moment during our company-wide meeting. So really, really enjoy that. But I want to talk to you all about how I use Figma as a researcher and kind of what that looks like for me. So, um, firstly, I love trading cards. So essentially what I use these for uh, when I'm wanting to get more information or just kind of like set the tone for a research session with a participant, I'll send these out as pre-work. And so that way they can fill in some of the things that we may wanna talk about during the conversation or maybe just things that I would like to know about them. Um, just kind of like warming up the atmosphere and making things not seem so, nervous, I guess sometimes anxiety can come with participating in research. So we definitely want people who participate and share their information with us to feel comfortable while they're doing that. And so this is this can be a fun way to, uh, to kind of set the scene. Also, what I really enjoy doing, so I'm gonna switch here, are exercises. So, these are different exercises, examples of what uh, I've done in the past and what we've done on the research team when we're trying to understand people. Um, so for example, Mad Libs, like during the research session, we may want to kind of know some things about maybe how people use Figma, how they feel about using Figma or other tools maybe how they're feeling in general about different things. So there's some like auto layout magic or yeah happening here. <laughs> um, so participants can come in and maybe like they can say weekly um, or whatever, uh, as far as like what we would like for them to kind of fill in so that we can get more information on that front. Um, so yeah, those are typically pretty fun, fun exercise. We enjoy doing those. And then also um, 
th things like these where we're trying to understand like do people actually understand how to use figma and so this is an example of like trying to get an understanding of that so if we're talking about oh do people know like where to find assets well if we're asking them to find this uh starter pokemon pokeball component uh where could that be boom it's in the assets and so if they drag it over and put it on the pokemon that they want to capture we know that they know how to use um, the assets panel and find components so it's just another way that we use figma and something that i think is really cool as far as like interactive things and then also slides <laughs> very simple kind of basic but still really cool to do in figma at least for me especially when i'm trying to dish out findings you know creating like really nice interactive slides is something that i really like to do especially when there's a lot of information that we may be going through side note tip here don't know if you know this or not but if you're in a meeting and you want to share uh, like a whole bunch of slides from different people and you don't want to have to like keep unsharing and then sharing different screens what you can do is have one person drive that slide share and then just observe so click on the person up here it's only me right now if you can see but other people who'd be in the figma file you can click on here and observe what they're doing and that way people can drive their own slides while just one person is sharing um so you don't have to go through the share and share share and share while you're on zoom um but like as far as interactive slides go you want to kind of split up the information just like oh where do we want to go choose your own adventure type style so you can go to orange info wow look at those findings awesome then you can go back and if you want to get some information on pink info you can go in Ooh, ah like so exciting so that can kind of spice up going through and like looking for information and trying to get a sense of what was found in research if uh, information is kind of kind of dense so that's how I use Figma. Hope y'all got something from that. Thank you so much, Nineral Up. I thought research was boring until I watched you, and now it feels like you made research so incredibly fun. Also, incredible use of auto layout for your Mad Libs. I'm impressed. That was all Heather. <laughs> Amazing. All right, well, we're on to our next speaker. Uh, and Emily, so glad to have you and hear what you have to share. Uh, let's go ahead and introduce yourself. All right, hi everyone. I, I also can't multitask, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, but I'm Emily, I'm a product manager at Figma and what I'm gonna share with all of you today, which I'm super excited to do, are just small tips on how I as a PM use Figma day in and day out. And while this might be a little bit novice for many of the designers on the call, hopefully it's helpful for people who are new to Figma, other PMs and other folks who are not designers in general. And so, Nanurl already showed a couple of great ways that you can execute on slides, but I want to show a couple of ways that I build slide decks. Slide decks are something that as a PM I do day in and day out. And not surprisingly, many of us at Figma use Figma almost exclusively for slides. And so the first thing I want to talk about is just how slides even work in Figma. I ran into this problem a couple of weeks ago when I shared a slide deck that looked like this to a brand new Figma employee. And they were like, how do I even read this? Like what's going on? And so the way slide decks work is you can more or less hack our prototyping functionality where if you have content and frames, which are a special type of box that you can click, make when you click this icon, uh, our prototyping feature will actually read everything from left to right and top to bottom. And so how you read this slide deck is essentially a presentation title, and then you go through section A, section B, section C. And now if I click this and I click play, that's actually how you can get it to work pretty much like a slide deck. And then you can click through and do all of the great things that Nineral was showing. I actually really like this visual grid method of making my slides more than that kind of like single line left to right or single line top to bottom, which you can also do. But this is really helpful for me for looking at like just generally load balancing the content and if seeing if everything visually aligns. Um, two other tricks that I really like in slide decks is we have a feature called smart selection that if you select everything and everything is kind of evenly spaced, 
you can actually grab these handles and it will magically visually adjust the spacing evenly. And that's that's been really helpful and nice for cleaning up things. Um, and the other thing I do a lot is you can use these handles to actually swap slides. So if you actually want to change sections, you can do that really quickly. Um, while I have everything selected, something else I use really often is what we call selection colors. And so I'll use this for making sure all of my colors are the same. Uh, I'm a very hacky Figma worker and I won't use styles properly. Like all of these are just straight up hex codes. Um, but what you can do here is let's say I don't like this coral that's used in this title and in this section labels. I can go to the selection colors on the right here, click here, and I can choose pretty much any other color I want and everything automatic, automatically changes together. And this is such a lifesaver. I actually use this to change grays a lot from like lighter gray to darker gray and whatnot. Something else that I find myself doing a lot is actually using Figma to annotate and mark up screenshots. This is actually probably not the most efficient way of doing it since I'll end up taking a screenshot, throwing it in Figma and then taking another screenshot. But I usually have at least like 10 Figma tabs open. And so this is somehow most convenient for me. Um, but the way I do it is you click Shift P to get to the pencil tool and then you can quickly draw and it does default to black when pixels, but you can customize that by going to the right and in the properties panel where it says stroke, you can change it to any other color you want. I usually go for a pretty obnoxious fuchsia and you can go here and change it to a bigger size. Um, the final thing that I do pretty often is making circle avatars. This is really helpful for when you're making a presentation and you wanna do a shout out to all of the people you wanna thank who contributed to the project. And so here, a small plug, this is just my cat Felix. <laughs> but what I do is because I'm really lazy, I use the corner radius thing here and I don't wanna do math to calculate the exact corner radius I need. And so I'll usually spam the nine number key and that will give me a perfect circle. And so that's all I had in terms of my tips, um, but these are just things that I do super often as a PM. Thank you all for joining. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Like I'm dying with you spamming the nines and then your colors or new band name of obnoxious fuchsia. Thank you for delivering stuff uh, for like non-design pros. Just great ways to use Figma. Appreciate it so much. All right, we're off to the races with Heather. Heather, introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Heather. I'm a designer on the community team. Uh, and one thing that I really love about Figma is that it's literally designed to help you out. And I'm going to show a few tips um, today re with regard to that. Um, so before I started using Figma for work, I actually used Figma to teach a visual design fundamentals class to mostly non-designers. And we would usually kick off the first day of class and we would ask people, hey, who here has ever used a vector editing program like Illustrator or Sketch or Figma? And maybe two or three hands out of 20 would go up. But ultimately at the end of the class, we would get them set up in Figma, they'd make their account. Um, we'd show them kind of the ropes like layers panel and things like that. But then their first homework assignment was to actually make an icon set. And we would give them all the resources they needed. We'd point them to you know, all the awesome tutorial videos that we have on YouTube, et cetera, so that they could essentially learn the tool on their own. Um, but there were a few tips that I made sure that before they left class, um, they did all of these things and they knew about them because I thought that these were so important to just getting true beginners off to a really good start. Um, and so I'm just gonna show you these tips real quick. So the first one is the pixel grid. So I feel like, you know, you hear designers talk about pixel perfect and things like that. And it's sort of like, well, what is the pixel grid? How do I use it? Um, and so if I zoom in really quickly, you'll see I don't have the pixel grid, but if I use my, my commands, uh -oh, I can turn it on. And now you can kind of see the grid show up on these Figma icons. And so I would show the, the students this and just say, hey, this is like a, what a one pixel line looks like when it's, when it's aligned to the grid and you can see things are aligning really nicely here. This will make sure that your icons show up nice and crisp. And so just, just being aware of that grid and turning it on so that when they zoom in, they can actually see it is, is point number one. Turn the pixel grid on, know what it is, know that it's there. The second point was snapping to grid. 
So if I zoom in on this lovely rectangle here, you'll see that it's not aligned to the grid. And if I show you the properties panel and click on it, you'll see that I've got all these funky decimals here. And this is not pixel perfect. So when people say, hey, we want it to be pixel perfect aligned to the grid, they're not talking about these crazy decimals. So you can actually turn on snapping, which is shift command quote, and you'll see a little uh, label pop up here. It says snap to pixel grid enabled. And now, of course, when you drag this around, whoop, it magically snaps and you get these nice round numbers. And this will work for any new shape that you draw on the canvas. And this is really great for um, just, you know, making sure that they don't have to worry about this stuff, that they don't have to worry about the decimals. And this, this is kind of like, you know, power, power tip, you know, 101 for like just making sure things are aligned and not really stressing about that. And if you do want to calculate or plug in decimals, you can always do that um, and do it really intentionally. So you get the, the nice, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.75 that you want, things like that. Um, so understanding the grid, being able to snap to it. And then thirdly, snapping to objects. So there's no uh, key um, keyboard shortcut for this, but if you open your, your search menu, command slash, you can just type in snap and you'll see you have snap to objects, snap to geometry. So you wanna make sure snap to objects is selected. Um, so if it's not selected, when I try to manipulate these and drag these around, I don't really get a ton of feedback. But if I, oops, if I turn it on, snap to object, then when I'm dragging these things around, I get all this like delicious feedback about, you know, how these things are actually aligning to each other, tops, bottoms, centers, the distance between them. And I can very quickly just kind of drag things around and manipulate them. And the reason I think this is really good for students to kind of have on by default is because it really gets you thinking about the relationship of your design objects to one another and proximity and space. So when we get you know farther into the semester and we really start talking about alignment and proximity and space, they're already kind of building up this, this muscle of like understanding the relationships of their objects to one another and just being really cognizant of that um, alignment. And so this is another good thing that I, I recommend all new designers kind of have on. Um, and then the last thing is now, you know, they're, they're designing an icon set. And usually when you're designing an icon and you're working at, you know, 24 by 24 or 16 by 16 or something very small, you're usually zoomed in really, really far. So you've got like some, you know, hundreds of percentages zoomed in. And this is really great for, you know, getting into the weeds and manipulating all these points. But oftentimes you can get really lost in the in the details here and what you really want to be cognizant of is like what does this actually look like for users you know at 100 percent when you're zoomed out so there's this neat trick so i i personally love using the desktop app you can do this in the browser just by opening up a new you know browser window and and opening up the same file but in the desktop app you can actually open up another instance of your desktop app and if you do that you can do a little split screen action. So you'll see over here, I have zoomed out to 100%. And there I am, it's very meta. And now I can do a little split screen side by side working where I'm manipulating these points here. And then I can see in real time what this is actually going to look like on somebody's device or somebody's computer at 100%. So I can really just, you know, be top of mind of, of, of how this is actually going to render for people. Um, and if my last pro tip for y'all is if multiplayer cursors are getting in your way, either you've got a ton of students in a file and they're flying all over the place or an instance like this where you're just playing around with yourself, you can actually turn that off. So again, if you open up your menu and type multiple, okay, multiplayer cursors, usually on by default, but you can turn it off and now you can just stop the chaos, get rid of the noise, and you can just work like this side by side with a little split screen action. So hopefully that was helpful for all the new beginners. Um, I love teaching Figma and I hope these tips help you out. I also use all of these, these top three tips. I have these on all the time. So that's that just like speeds up my workflow a ton. So hope that helped. Thank you. That was really awesome, Heather. I've seen you use Figma in ways that I haven't. Uh, some hits were the delicious feedback, really a big hit uh, in that 100% Zoom trick. Thanks so much for sharing that. That was really, really great for getting in on those icons. All right, well, we're off to Anthony. Anthony, I hope you're all ready. Let's see what you got to share for us. All set, awesome. Hey, everybody. 
Nice to see you. Um, I've got a, uh, a quick thing for you today. So, so I'm Anthony. I'm one of the designer advocates. I'm, I'm sure I've seen some of your faces before. Uh, we're going to talk today very quickly about uh, blend modes. So blend modes, a uh, little known thing in Figma, often you see them in um, what we call like bitmap tools. So things like Photoshop and whatnot, but we also do have them in Figma too. Um, I, I see uh, how I learned how to stop playing blend mode roulette, because if you're like me, I constantly sit there and I just sort of pick the blend modes and cycle through them until I find the one that I need, because I don't actually know what I'm looking for or what's going to do the best thing. So uh, hopefully today you can walk away with a couple of things that will uh, help you understand them a little bit better. So let's do a little bit of history first. Um, what are blend modes, right? So blend modes are where you have an active layer or the blend layer that blends with layers that are below it as well. Um, this is not entirely rooted in like the old art forms as far as things like dark, like dodging and burning and whatnot. But um, when we started to digitize colors, it became pretty obvious that we could do some fun stuff with those numbers, right? So you have simple blend modes like multiply where you're just multiplying values together. Uh, you get to more complicated ones like soft light. I couldn't actually tell you what's going on here, but you can sort of see how these things um, allow you to do some pretty interesting things with your layers. There's two types of blend modes. One is called um, blend modes on the fills themselves. So if you select a fill, you'll notice that there's a little uh, droplet icon where you can set a blend mode. You can, do, you can set separate blend modes on each of your fills. Uh, you can also set them on images or gradients or anything like that as well. The other type is a layer blend. So this can be either a layer that's an object or a frame that's containing other objects as well. And you'll see that in the layers panel. And, It'll always say uh, by default, it'll say pass through. And maybe you're like me and you've, you've always wondered what the heck is pass through? Why do I always see pass through? So um, <clears throat> to explain it very quickly, pass through is basically telling Figma to allow the blend modes to not only apply to the current grouping or the current frame, but also pass through all the way down to any other layers that might be below it as well. This is generally the default if you've used this in something like um, Photoshop or any other tools. Normal is going to actually have it stop at that current group. So here's a great example. And thank you to Marchin for uh, letting me <laughs> use this example here. Um, you can see here that when we have pass through turned on by default, it's passing through and actually affecting the layers before uh, below us. So uh, below what we have here, whereas with pass through uh, with the layer actually set to normal, we're not going to we're only going to blend on the layers that are in that group, not passing all the way through to the layers below it. So generally, you can, can leave it on pass through if you're just trying to get normal behavior. Another interesting thing, if you've ever noticed these actual blend modes are grouped into different groupings. And the groupings actually apply to what type of math is being used. So uh, we have darkened ones, which will add or, or sort of multiply values upward, and then subtractive colors, contrasting, comparative. You, if you want to read about all this, definitely check out blend modes. Uh, if you just Google it, you'll find a lot of really cool details on how all of this kind of math works. And different tools will actually implement this in different ways. So that's, a, that's an interesting one to keep in mind. Let's look at a couple of good use cases, right? We could talk about all the different ways the blend modes work, but what are some practical ways that I use these day to day? Uh, a big one is removing backgrounds, right? So if you have, um, you know, in, in a perfect scenario, we've got a nice SVG, there's no background color, there's nothing like that. Sometimes we're moving pretty quickly and we just have a PNG, there's a white background. You can quickly knock those out uh, using the multiply blend mode. So you'll see here that we're able to actually just get the, the text by itself. Other great use cases for this are things like um, if you've got something that's in handwriting that you just want to take out the white background because you like shot a picture of a, of a signature or someone's handwriting and, and that's a quick way to do it. Gradient overlays. These are an awesome way to create more depth than simply just uh, applying an opacity gradient over an image. Try the blend modes for something like screen or color dodge and you'll see that your colors will pop a lot more instead of sort of having a faded contrast. So it actually helps a lot with with doing that kind of that kind of thing. Next, we've got replacing colors or screening colors, right? So you can do fun things with typography using uh, the multiply effect. Uh, if we use hard light and color dodge, as you see over here, 
we can do some pretty powerful things as far as like creating screen printing like effects or desaturating and then applying a hard light fill and things like that. So um, if you're doing overlays on top of imagery where you have colors, try using the blend modes because you'll find that it looks a lot more vibrant or you'll get better contrast than if you just use a color at say 50% or something like that. Uh, next, desaturation masks. So you can actually desaturate part of an image. In fact, you can do this with all of the blend modes too. You can have a mask that is, use it like a mask where it's not necessarily the entire image, but just a portion of the image where maybe you wanna highlight something. So in, in which case we may actually do the inverse of this, right? Where we want just the, the Corgi's face to be in color instead of the whole thing. Um, but a lot of power with that one. And then lastly, uh, inversions. So some of the more creative effects, you can certainly uh, do things that we might, uh, might might see on, you know, vintage uh, 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 television shows and things like that, but um, fun ones to play around with. So check out those later sections like uh, difference and uh, contrast and things like, and uh, some of those examples there. All right, I am out of time. Thank you all. Good seeing you again and glad to see you. Uh, I'm glad we're back. <laughs> Anthony, so glad you're back. Uh, that was incredible. I didn't even know pass through. So you taught me something. So uh, so many people in the chat just saying like, whoa, you're demystifying blend modes. I love it. Thanks, man. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we're off to Louie now. Louie, introduce yourself. Tell us about you. Thanks, dearest Roger. I'm going to share my screen. Hi, everybody. My name's Louis Louie Oriash, and I'm Figma's designer advocate for Europe. My favorite thing about Figma is that I get to do this for a job. What could be better? Today, I'm gonna to talk about variants and variant organization more specifically. So let's take a look at what we've got over here. I've got a bunch of potential components lined up here. And the first thing that I wanna do is turn them into components. So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit, drag a box over these and turn them into components. And then for those of you that have used variants before, uh, this would be familiar. But for those of you that haven't, you'll notice that I've set these up with some familiar naming conventions. So what we have here is a small, large, medium, and extra small card component. And then we have different states of those components. I have default, inactive, active, and hover. First thing I want to do here is to space these out a little bit more to give me some more room to play with. So I'm gonna type in 240, 240 here to space them out a little bit. And then what, then what I wanna do is combine them as a variant. So I'm gonna click the combine as variants button. And now what we're gonna do is pull these together to create a layout grid inside of our variants. I'm gonna come down here, check the plus on layout grid. I'm gonna change this to columns. And then what I wanna do is make a four by four grid. So I know I need four in the count and I'm gonna change the, the gutter. I'm gonna change that to zero. So on here, just move the panel up, move that gutter down to zero. They could then see we get some columns popping up. I'm gonna change the color to hundred percent so we can see that a little bit more. And then what I'm gonna do is add some rows in here as well. Pop down here. I know I want four again. I'm gonna change the to 100% and remove that gutter. We then get a nice four by four grid on our variant panel. The next thing I wanna do is start to align these inside those panels. So if I zoom in a little bit and just eyeball this one for now, obviously you can spend a little bit more time when you're doing this yourself. And I'm gonna select all of these together and right align them using that alignment panel at the top. Then I can center align this one, do the same with these and align this one central as well. And then align these to the left because I've moved it in from the right hand side and then the same with this one. Once that's done, I can start to think about aligning them vertically. So I can move this one to the center and pull these together. Same with this smaller version. And then lastly, with the small, extra small version. So we've got something to come in together here. If I wanted to take this to the next level, I could add a background color onto here. So let's add a fill on my variant. Let's make it a little bit darker so we can see that contrast. And then I can add some labels in here. So I know that I have my article card as the title. Let's just bump that font size up. And then what I want to say is that I have different states and I have different sizes. So I can duplicate this and say, this is my state, pull that font size down and align that like so. And then I'm also gonna have the size over here. And I'm gonna rotate this 90 degrees. Then I can pull a copy of this, remove the, uh, pull the font size down again, and say I have my default here. I have my inactive. I have my active. And then lastly, I have my hover state here. And then the same for the sizes. 
So I can pull this down like so and say large, medium, just align those together. We have our small, and then we have our extra small down like so. And then we have a nicely organized layout grid inside our variant component. If you want to take it to the next level, I've got an oven ready example over here. If I just zoom in a little bit, you can see at the top left section, I've got some information about my card. So I've got the title, the platforms it's used on, a description for how it will be used, and also a label for the status of that component. This will be really useful if you're building out a design systems team that's maybe a little bit larger and people will be dipping in and out of your files to see the status of those. And you can see I've got my state and size labels at the top and the left, and then some little pills that give me a bit of information about those components in there. So this is a bit more of a branded example, but something that hopefully you can use going forward as well. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, dear, my dearest Louis. Uh, thanks for showing us cool inventive ways to use grids as well, which I probably never use grids like that. So thanks so much, man. Appreciate it a lot. All right, so we've got two more speakers left. Super excited about this one. Lauren, are you ready? Yeah, hey Reggie, thanks. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen as well. Okay, so this tip is gonna be a little bit um, more geared towards uh, engineering types. Hi, I'm, I'm Lauren, I'm an engineer at Figma. I work on the Figma editor. Um, my favorite thing about working at Figma is that working on a creative tool with creative people makes me feel more creative. Um, and today I'm gonna talk about using uh, the plugin API to kind of like find things you want. The thing that I do a lot as an engineer is one, I don't organize my files well, so there's not a lot of like styles or components. And then also sometimes I get files sent to me where people found a problem and they have to find like in this huge file, what is like the one node with a weird effect or something like that. Um, so we are gonna talk through using plugins uh, to find things. So um, I'm gonna go here. Uh, you can use this link or you can just Google uh, Figma plugin API overview. Um, and this is gonna tell you all the ways you can programmatically interact with uh, Figma. So, I am going to um, take a file. This is Joey's nice UI uh, file. And it's really well organized, lots of styles and stuff. We can pretend that it's not. Um, and I'll open the JavaScript console. And so I have this huge file, like maybe I don't know my way around it. Maybe I'm looking for something in particular. So the thing I'm gonna do first is uh, maybe I want uh, to find all of the nodes with background blurs. Um, so the way that you kind of interact with like the, the thing that you're looking at is, is current page. So this is a page note. If you expand this, you can see all the things that it has, it has like all these children, um, stuff like that. I'm going to go kind of fast because, uh, this, like you, your use cases are as varied as there are like number of Figma users. Um, but you can find all the information about the things you need in this API reference. So I'll do like Figma current, oops, current page, find all, and then I'm going to find, uh, all of the nodes for which um, some condition is true. So what if I want the condition um, return uh, like effects is not null and effects, uh, let's see, I know I'm live coding, this is silly. Um, effect dot type is background blur. So now this is gonna find all of the background blurs in this uh, document. Um, I can set these to a variable, BG, or we'll call this blurs. Um, so now let's do like, if I wanna select all of these, um, I can just set the selection to blurs. Okay, so now these are all the nodes in my, in my document with blurs. Um, maybe I want to, uh, like I could filter this further. Maybe I could like filter this by just rectangle nodes or something like that. Um, but for now let's do, uh, let's manipulate these a little bit. So for each blur uh, node, um, and then I'll do like and dot effects and dot effects that filter. Wow, uh, very dangerous effect. Effect that type is not background blur. Uh, Okay, so now I've deleted all the background blurs. You can see like here, there used to be blurs. There's not anymore. Uh, maybe I decided I didn't actually want to delete them. I wanted to hide them. Like someone might want to see them later. I can just undo, like I, I just did Command Z, um, like you regular undo. 
And then I still have blurs sort of like stored in local memory. So I could do something else with them. Like maybe now I'm gonna do, uh, instead of filtering them, I'll just do map. Um, and then I'm gonna write a little map here. All right, the other great thing is you do need to know a little bit of JavaScript, but you can write really messy JavaScript because it does not matter. So let's do a copy is effect. I'm gonna talk about this in a little bit. Um, co if copy.type is background blur, um, then copy vis visible equals, and then maybe I forget what uh, the visibility should look like. So I'm gonna go here to effects. Uh, visible is Boolean, so I'll just set it to false, return, copy. Okay, so now I just set these all to invisible, but you can see, uh, I don't know how to find this, or I could, but I'm running out of time. Um, so so that's kind of like how you can find your way around uh, Figma doc with plugins. Um, these are my two favorite functions for sure is find all, which finds all of the nodes that match a thing in a document, find children, finds all of the direct children of the given node. So this can be current page or it can be any node. Um, most node properties are getters and setters. They're easily uh, mutated, but as you saw from effects, um, you do have to kind of like copy arrays or objects because they're read only. So you'll have to like write a write a new copy to overwrite the array or object. Uh, but so it's a good way to kind of like bash around the plugin API. Um, and if you ever need help, you can definitely reach out. Thanks. Lauren, that was amazing. And for what I would think is a group of designers, these designers' minds were absolutely blown. And you may have made like junior developers of all these people. So good job there. Uh, we also have a comment that said, can they use the find all method to find their toddler? I hope so. All right, and our, <laughs> awesome. Uh, our last guest on is Miggy or Miggy from Figgy as we call him here. Miggy, on to you, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Miguel or Miggy from Figgy. I just got to own it. I just got to totally own it, Raji. Um, so I'm a designer advocate for uh, education here at Figma. I just started uh, earlier this January. Um, one of my favorite things about Figma is just the community and how enthusiastic everyone is. Um, so I'm gonna start off today. Um, I've got the little shortcut key. I actually add these shortcut keys to like my document just to kind of like help me remember myself uh, what some of my favorite shortcut keys are. So uh, today we're going to talk about when in doubt use e ease in out, talk a little bit about prototyping, smart animate and the uh, custom easing tool which uh, just was released in uh, August. Um, so tweens, whenever you're creating any kind of like programmatic motion in, um, you know, like animation programs or things like that, you know, what you're doing is you're kind of creating keyframes and you're animating from one point to the next. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is kind of talk you through um, the way that I like to mentally think about these tweens and the way that I like to use the ease graph to really kind of hone in how I work on my animations. So I'm gonna drop into prototype mode real quick. So option nine. Um, and so here I'm just going to show just a very simple tween. So if I have these two keyframes, it's going from point A to point B, I'm going to click on this frame and you can see that when I click, I'm going to navigate to another screen. I'm going to use Smart Animate and Smart Animate is going to look at the properties of both frames and try to do what it can to tween between those. Right now I'm just going to use a linear animation just so you can kind of see like, you know, how this works out. Um, I have this over here. So if I reset this frame and I click, you will see what it does is it identifies that that frame needs to move over. So let's talk a little bit more about easing. Um, so when you're dealing with easing, you are going to be dealing with a couple of simple ones, ease in, ease out, ease in, out, linear are probably the most common. So the way that I really like to think about it is that ease in is if you think like a car that is starting from a stopped position, kind of gaining momentum and reaching a top speed. So if I take a look right here, and uh, I'm just gonna drop over my little prototype nub so it'll play this one instead. So we can take a look. Hold on, I have my zoom window, there we go. So I can click that and I can see that I'm taking this object, it's starting from a stopped position and it's moving off screen at this top velocity. Um, so 
that's kind of like the way that I think about it, but also where is it going, right? Oftentimes, you know, I'm like, okay, I can use this to move off screen. It's going to reach its top velocity. It's just off into nowhere. So an ease in ease out uh, is going to be a little bit different. It's usually when you have something that's off screen kind of moving on screen, it's slowing down. So if you think about a car kind of like coming into your vision, it hit its top speed and then it's starting to slow down to its main point. So it hits its top speed and then it's slowly deaccelerating. So if I go ahead and uh, I take a look at that one, right? So it was off screen, it's kind of slowing down, it had its top velocity, velocity and then it's kind of coming into this point. Uh, next, linear, a lot of designers and motion graphics artists will kind of trash linear because it's a robotic motion. Our eyes perceive it and it's just like, eh, I don't really like that. It doesn't look right. But there is a time and a place for using linear. So a simple way to think about this is if you're moving from on off screen to on screen, right, it has a constant motion. So if a car is kind of like outside of your periphery, it's, uh, you know, going like, you know, 60 miles or like 120 kilometers an hour and you just see it going and then it goes off your screen, right? It moved at that constant speed. So there still is a time and a place for that. But now we're going to talk about ease in and out. This is kind of like my handy utility. It's the GOAT, if you will, of the easing curves. It contains a little bit of both. So there's the acceleration, deacceleration. So it has the ease in, has the ease out, and it also has this midpoint where it kind of reaches that top speed. So whenever you have something that is on screen and it's moving to on screen, you can kind of have that kind of nice ease in out motion. It's going to be the one that's most common that you're going to see in a lot of interfaces. So even if I'm just moving from point A to point B, it has that nice motion. It's more of a complete transition as it takes back. Now, another thing that you can do is you can look at ease out in, out back, right? So if we look at that easing curve, here it is, and here is how I am adjusting it. Uh, what that is, is it has a little bit of uh, kind of like before and a little bit of after. Um, so what that's doing is kind of revving up and kind of slowing down. So this community file I will be making available on figma.com slash at Miggy. Um, I have a couple of ad other additional examples here. So this is a bouncing cube. And basically as it goes up and down, it's kind of swapping between ease in and ease out, ease in and ease out. Um, I'm not gonna play that one, but I'm gonna jump into my little Pac-Man example. I like my Pac-Man example. Uh, I need to close out my little window and replay that one. Let me go ahead and hit that. And my little Pac-Man example has the ease in out kind of like functionality there. So if I click in between those frames, I can see that there's my ease in, right? It's that slow acceleration and then it's closing out. Uh, so it's gonna be that little bit more natural motion that I'm looking for. And then I have one last one where I'm playing around a little bit more with that bouncing effect to get a little bit more elasticity um, or magnetism, right? If you wanna have a little bit more personality in uh, the forces that are kind of like taking place in your animation. So what I'm using is I'm using like an auto delay to constantly reference the next frame, the next frame. So if you take a look and you can see that here, I have after delay one millisecond because you can't use zero navigating to the next frame. And then I'm using those easing curves to approximate those points. So let me go back to my main points. Um, so basically, whenever you're thinking about motion, think about what it is you're trying to communicate with the motion. Where is your object going? How far does it have to travel? What is the perceived weight, mass? How should it move relative to its size? And what is its relationship to other objects? And you're kind of getting at the core of motion. Uh, don't wait till you have fidel high fidelity mockups of prototype. Prototype with rough wireframes in the early stages. Uh, it's like failure. You should do it early and often when solving complex problems. Thank you. Miggy, that was amazing. Uh, similarly to Anthony's demystifying of all of the blend modes, I feel like you really nailed that. But also, I'm wondering when you're giving your next physics class, because I feel like that's the follow-up here. That was so great, man. Thank you. All right. Well, everyone, uh, we can't hear you all, but if you would give, if you loved this, if you liked this, uh, lots of our figmates put their time into this. If you would give them a round of applause, some emoji claps, get creative with that emoji usage. Uh, I'm sure that they would love it. Um, this kind of concludes our live stream for today. Like I said, we're hoping to have a ton of momentum going into this year and putting lots more live streams out for you all. 
Um, as a reminder, this session, I know we had lots of questions about this. This session is going to be recorded. It'll be available on youtube.com slash Figma design. You can subscribe if you want to just get the notification. Should take about a week. Uh, any ideas for future live streams, you can send off to me here at rking at figma.com. And just as a note, if you're digging this live stream, uh, we can always, you can always see future live streams at figma.com slash events. Also, tomorrow at 9 a.m., we have an in the file unexpected design stories at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So thank you so much for joining us. And I just want to say thank you so much to all the Figmates that joined. Uh, Y'all made this amazing and we've never done this many people on a live stream. So bravo, thank you so much.